Elon Musk reveals Starship landing trick. Never done before. SpaceX just got FAA approval documents for the most ambitious rocket recovery ever attempted. For the first time, Starship will return directly to its launch site in Texas. Not the ocean, not a downrange pad. The flight path, screaming across the Pacific at Mach 25, cutting through Mexican airspace where 200 aircraft fly per hour. We're talking 4,000 potential flight disruptions annually. This return to launch site maneuver has never been done with a vehicle this massive. The technical challenge is brutal. Survive 1,400 degrees Celsius re-entry, nail precision landing burns, and get caught by Mechazilla's arms. Flight 11 is next. Let's dive right in. The FAA documents lay out exactly how this unprecedented maneuver will work, and the details are stunning. After Starship launches from Starbase and completes its orbital mission, the upper stage begins its return journey over the Northeast Pacific Ocean, just north of Hawaii. This is where the complexity begins. At orbital velocity, Starship is traveling at approximately 27,000 kilometers per hour. That's roughly 25 times the speed of sound. The vehicle must survive the furnace of re-entry while following a precise flight corridor that cuts across the Pacific, passes directly over northern Mexico, and terminates back at the launch site in Texas. This isn't just a technical challenge. The flight path intersects with some of the busiest commercial airspace on Earth. According to the FAA assessment, up to 200 aircraft transit this corridor every single hour. With SpaceX planning 22 Starship launches annually, between 3,000 and 4,000 commercial flights could face delays or rerouting each year. Every launch requires coordination between U.S. and Mexican aviation authorities, making this as much a diplomatic operation as an aerospace one. But why would SpaceX commit to such a complicated approach? The answer reveals their entire strategy. True reusability means the rocket launches, lands at the same pad, gets refueled, and launches again. No recovery ships, no transport back from remote landing zones, no weeks of refurbishment. This is the only path to making space access routine and affordable. That's why they're willing to navigate this complexity. Understanding this flight path is crucial because it sets up the even more challenging part of the equation, bringing the booster home. While Starship follows its Pacific route, the super heavy booster faces its own critical mission. After separation at approximately 70 kilometers altitude, just minutes into the flight, the booster must execute a controlled return to Starbase. The FAA documents reveal SpaceX has planned two distinct return trajectories, and the choice between them depends on real-time conditions. The first route takes the booster northeast over the Gulf of Mexico, crossing Florida before heading out over the Atlantic Ocean. The second route goes southeast, threading between Mexico and Cuba, passing Jamaica, then continuing into the Atlantic. This flexibility is essential because weather, air traffic density, and mission parameters change with every flight. Here's what makes this so difficult. The booster stands 230 feet tall and weighs over 200 tons when empty. After separation, it's falling back toward Earth at supersonic speeds. The vehicle must reignite its Raptor engines mid-descent to perform what's called a boost back burn, literally reversing its trajectory while still at high altitude. Then comes the landing burn, where the booster must decelerate from hundreds of meters per second to nearly zero in just seconds. The final phase is where precision becomes everything. The booster must position itself perfectly, within centimeters, so that Mechazilla's mechanical arms can catch it at the launch tower. This catch maneuver was successfully demonstrated on Flight 5, but executing it consistently, launch after launch, represents an entirely different level of difficulty. One degree off on the approach angle, one second late on the engine ignition, one miscalculation in the guidance system, and the booster either crashes into the tower, misses the catch completely, or comes down in an uncontrolled descent. That's why the FAA scrutiny is so intense. This booster recovery is the first half of the equation, but the real technical gauntlet? That's what Starship itself faces during re-entry. Flight 10 marked a major milestone when it reached orbit and completed most mission objectives. But the engineering data from that flight revealed critical issues that SpaceX must solve before return to launch site operations 
can become routine. The heat shield performance remains the most pressing concern. During re-entry, several of the hexagonal ceramic tiles that protect Starship's steel structure came loose. These tiles must withstand temperatures reaching 1,400 degrees Celsius as the vehicle slams into the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. Each missing tile exposes the stainless steel underneath, which begins to soften and weaken at these extreme temperatures. SpaceX engineers are now testing improved attachment methods, including new adhesive systems and mechanical retention designs. They're also identifying high-stress zones where tiles are most likely to fail in reinforcing those areas. This isn't a minor issue. A significant tile loss during re-entry could result in structural failure and loss of the vehicle. Engine performance presented another challenge on Flight 10. While the Raptor engines successfully pushed Starship to orbit, several engines didn't operate at full efficiency during the ascent phase. The Raptor is the most powerful methane-fueled rocket engine ever built, generating over 230 tons of thrust each, but reliability under extreme conditions is still being refined. During landing operations, engine performance becomes even more critical. If an engine fails to ignite during the final descent burn or produces insufficient thrust, the vehicle cannot execute a controlled landing. SpaceX is conducting detailed analysis of each engine's performance and implementing improvements to increase reliability margins. The Composite Overwrapped Pressure Vessels, COPVS, also showed vulnerabilities on Flight 10. These tanks store high-pressure helium and other gases needed to operate the rocket's systems. Multiple flights have experienced issues with these vessels and a catastrophic failure during flight could trigger explosive decompression, potentially destroying the vehicle. Perhaps most important for the return to launch site mission is landing precision. Flight 10 demonstrated that Starship can control its descent and execute a landing burn, but the positional accuracy wasn't yet sufficient for a tower catch. The vehicle must hit a specific three-dimensional coordinate in space at a specific velocity and orientation for Megazilla to successfully grab it. SpaceX is refining the guidance, navigation, and control software to achieve this precision. They're also testing more aggressive descent profiles that give the vehicle better control authority during the final approach. Every flight generates data that feeds into these improvements. These technical challenges aren't speculation. They're documented in SpaceX's own post-flight analyses in the FAA assessment. Solving them is what separates an experimental test program from an operational transportation system. The question is whether SpaceX can solve them fast enough to meet their ambitious launch schedule. And that brings us to the bigger picture. To understand why this landing trick matters, you need to see where SpaceX stands today. In 2025, they've already launched 98 rockets, 96 Falcon 9s, and two Starships. By comparison, Ariane Space, one of the world's major launch providers, averages 11 to 12 launches per year across all their vehicles. In 2024, SpaceX set a record with 134 Falcon launches. The year before that saw 96 Falcon family launches. No other organization in history has operated at this tempo. And here's the key metric. As of late September 2025, SpaceX has successfully landed Falcon 9 boosters 496 times. Individual boosters have flown up to 30 missions each. During the second quarter of 2025 alone, SpaceX launched 45 missions, representing 57% of all orbital launches worldwide and over 90% of all payload mass sent to orbit that quarter. These aren't projections or goals. These are actual operational statistics. This is why the return to launch site capability for Starship is so crucial. Falcon 9 proved that rapid reusability works for medium lift rockets. Starship is designed to carry 100 to 150 tons to low Earth orbit, roughly 10 times Falcon 9's capacity. If SpaceX can apply the same reusability model to a vehicle this large, the cost per kilogram to orbit drops dramatically. Lower costs enable everything else. NASA's Artemis program relies on Starship to land astronauts on the moon. Mars missions require dozens of Starship launches to pre-position cargo and fuel. Commercial satellite deployment, space station construction, space tourism, and even point-to-point -point cargo transport on Earth all become economically viable when launch costs drop by an order of magnitude. 
but there's risk embedded in these numbers. With 22 planned Starship launches per year crossing Mexican airspace, a single failure during the return phase could scatter debris across populated areas. A missed landing could destroy the launch tower and set the program back months or years. The margin between revolutionary success and catastrophic failure is measured in milliseconds of engine burn time and centimeters of positional accuracy. That's why every test flight matters. That's why the FAA is requiring extensive environmental and safety assessments. And that's why SpaceX is methodically working through each technical challenge before attempting routine return to launch site operations. The infrastructure to support this cadence is already being built. SpaceX is expanding production facilities at Starbase, constructing additional launch mounts and stockpiling vehicles. They're not planning for occasional test flights. They're building for sustained high-tempo operations. This operational tempo is what separates SpaceX's approach from traditional space programs. They're applying lessons from aviation, build multiple vehicles, fly them repeatedly, learn from each mission, and iterate quickly. It's working for Falcon 9. The question is whether it scales to Starship. Flight 11 is scheduled within the next couple of months, with Flight 12 following shortly after. SpaceX is targeting five to six Starship launches total in 2025, a significant increase compared to 2024, when technical delays and regulatory reviews limited flight opportunities. Elon Musk has stated the goal is to achieve one Starship launch approximately every two months initially, with that cadence accelerating as the vehicle matures and operations become routine. Each upcoming flight will test specific capabilities, improved heat shield designs, refined engine performance, enhanced landing precision, or flight path validation through the approved corridors. The FAA approval for return to launch site operations is the critical path item now. Once those environmental assessments are finalized and operational permits are granted, the program can transition from experimental test flights to something approaching regular operations. The documents published by the FAA indicate that SpaceX has completed the detailed planning, flight paths are mapped, safety protocols are defined, and international coordination frameworks are being established. But here's what makes the next phase unpredictable. No amount of simulation or ground testing fully replicates the conditions of an actual orbital mission. Heat shield performance under real re-entry conditions, engine reliability during critical landing burns, structural integrity after multiple flights, these can only be validated through actual flight operations. Every flight generates terabytes of data from hundreds of sensors monitoring every system. That data feeds back into design improvements, software updates, and operational procedures. This iterative development process is faster than traditional aerospace programs, but also means each flight carries risk. The international dimension adds another layer of complexity. Mexico's cooperation is essential since the flight path crosses their airspace. Airlines need confidence that flight disruptions will be manageable. Insurance companies need actuarial data on success rates and failure modes. These aren't technical problems. They're institutional and political challenges that take time to resolve. What we're witnessing is the transition point where Starship stops being an experimental prototype and starts becoming an operational vehicle. That transition is never smooth. There will be more failures, more delays, more investigations. But the trajectory is clear. SpaceX has demonstrated that their approach works. Falcon 9 went through similar growing pains. Early landing attempts failed spectacularly before the system was refined. Now Falcon 9 boosters routinely land and refly. Starship is following the same path, just at a much larger scale with correspondingly larger challenges. The return to launch site capability represents the final piece of the reusability puzzle. When both the booster and the ship can land back at Starbase, refuel, and fly again within days or weeks, Starship becomes what Musk has promised from the beginning, a true spacecraft, not just a rocket. That's the vision. Whether it becomes reality depends on the next several flights and whether SpaceX can solve the remaining technical challenges while maintaining the aggressive pace they've set for themselves. The stakes are enormous, the risks are real, and the world is watching. This is exactly why this landing trick matters. SpaceX isn't just bringing a rocket home. They're proving that routine, affordable space access is actually possible.
When Starship can land back at Starbase consistently, the cost to reach orbit drops by a factor of 10. That means NASA can return humans to the moon. Mars missions become operational, not theoretical. The 60-year-old barrier keeping space expensive finally breaks. Flight 11 launches within weeks. SpaceX is building vehicles faster than they can test them. China is racing to match this capability. Blue Origin is pushing hard with New Glenn. We're entering a new space race, but this time it's driven by economics and reusability, not just national pride. Here's what comes next. Orbital refueling stations, cargo delivery across Earth in under an hour, permanent space stations, and eventually Mars colonies. The technology being tested right now enables all of it. So where do you think this takes us in five years? Will SpaceX nail the landing on Flight 11, or will we see more failures first? Drop your prediction in the comments. I read every single one. This is Space Hub. We break down the real engineering, the actual challenges, and what it means for humanity's future in space. If you want in-depth analysis like this on every major space development, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss Flight 11's coverage. And if this video gave you a new perspective, leave a like. It genuinely helps us reach more space enthusiasts like you. The era of throwaway rockets is ending. What's being built right now will define the next century of human spaceflight. And we're here to cover every breakthrough. Fifty-three years since the last boot print. We put 12 men on the moon, then ghosted it completely. When Elon Musk launched SpaceX, he didn't just build rockets. He exposed the dirty secret NASA buried for decades. It wasn't aliens. It wasn't danger. It was something worse. Political sabotage. Every president killed the last one's moon program. $20 billion burned. Apollo's budget was slashed from 4% to 0.36%. The Constellation program? Canceled.